My name is Michael O'Reilly. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Rochester. I started with a guy named uh, Dr. Barker. Dr. Barker is a scientist, a physician who a couple of years ago made an observation that said children born with low birth weight had a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease later in life. And I think a lot of this now is spread to a bunch of different concepts. For example, it's well known that uh, Rochester has been leading the effort in lead uh, remediation in their uh, inner cities because a lot of children will lick the paint on a wall or lick the paint on a windowsill. And what we know is that leads to long-term uh, deficits in cognition or how, how the brain develops. Uh, there's lots of studies showing if children are born in households where mom or dad are heavy smokers, there's a higher incidence of these children having uh, asthma and other sorts of diseases uh, associated with their airways. So it, it makes sense that in some ways if you're born prematurely and now you are outside of mom prior to when you're supposed to be, that the way our bodies develop has now been altered, uh, the trajectory of that development is altered. And therefore, later in life, your ability to respond to stuff that happens to you is now altered. For example, the work that we're doing, we know that children born prematurely are often given high oxygen at birth. And later in life, children who are born prematurely have a higher association of being uh, sicker when they uh, get uh, infected with uh, viruses in the first two years of life. And so we're very interested in understanding how does oxygen reprogram the lung development and at the same time reprogram how the lung is supposed to deal with things like virus infections. We know that children born prematurely are also have a higher incidence of um, uh, needing eyeglasses later in life. Uh, their eyes are sensitive to oxygen and oxygen impairs that development. And so there'll be younger children wearing eyeglasses. There's also cognition changes that we know happen in children. And there's some thinking that maybe some of these children that are born very, very early later in life might end up having high blood pressure sooner than one might expect. My research is focused on the incidence of high oxygen exposure in children, and we have to start someplace, otherwise things just get too out of control, too, too, too uh, wieldy, if you will. So our goal is to start with the oxygen as a model paradigm. If we can get some traction in the oxygen model, we want to expand it. So we begin to ask the questions, for example, oxygen um, has to deal with food, and so food gets taken in by our, our, our bodies, and gets converted to a, uh, ATP and glucose gets converted to ATP with oxygen. We need to understand the relationship between that. It may have something to do with the obesity issues later in life. It may have an effect of the low birth weight I mentioned earlier, that there's this balance between the need for oxygen and the need for food. And then one can then begin to expand even further and start bringing in the ideas of what happens to children as they grow up. So you have children living in dirty uh, cities, uh, children living in poor urban air quality, uh, children potentially licking lead paint, um, the phthalates and the stuff in drinking water that people worry about, the dioxins in the drinking water. All of this fits under that bigger umbrella of what happens while you're growing up may adversely affect how you deal with life later on. I, I get asked often, why am I most interested in this field? Right. And it's interesting. I think people get called to do things because of uh, what happens to them. I'm reminded of a song that John Lennon once sang. Uh, it said, life is what happens to you while you're making plans. So 25 years ago, I was a graduate student in Cincinnati, Ohio, working in a neonatologist lab. And I was studying how uh, cells of the lung produced uh, a surfactant protein that made the lungs work more effectively. It was called surfactant protein A at the time. And I remember the clinical fellows delivering surfactant lipids to children born prematurely. And we're so excited to see how these children who are on high oxygen and high ventilation uh, how quickly their oxygen saturations normalize. 25 years later, this is a standard of care we give to most of the children born uh, very prematurely that need some help with their uh, breathing oxygen. So I'm studying how cells respond to oxygen because that's what I was doing here. And then my son Thomas was born uh, five years ago and he was seven weeks premature. And fortunately for us, um, meaning my wife and I, he was not terribly sick. He just needed an incubator to keep his body warm. He didn't need surfactant and he didn't need excess, uh, any uh, excessive treatments. But I do remember watching the other children around the NICU at that time and watching and seeing how small they were and how frail they were and watching them getting the surfactant that I felt like I had contributed to when I was younger. Uh, and it reminded me of that time period and I became very interested in trying to do something about that, take it to the next step. The next step being we know surfactant works, we've saved these children, we have got a lot of children leaving the NICUs that are happy and healthy and going home and everybody's happy about that. And yet we know that there's an association of having uh, an impaired ability to deal with things later in life, whether it's a respiratory viral infection or the things that I've mentioned. And so I feel called to do something about that. And I'm doing it by helping to build a program that will try to bring together a diverse community of investigators that are uh, from basic scientists like in biology, 
to the physicians in the, in the uh, Galasano Children's Hospital that are really going after these issues. And if I can put this together effectively and we can make, um, uh, make some sort of an observation about what's going on that could lead to therapies in the future, then I feel I've done my job. Ideally, if we can come up with a therapy, that would be great. But, you know, let's take the first step. First step is let's identify the problem, let's build a group of people, and let's go after it in a, in a meaningful manner.